On the agenda tonight, we're going back to 1990. We're going to be taking a look at Phil Palmer's impromptu solo with Eric Clapton during Before You Accuse Me. Hello, Phil here from Wings of Pegasus and welcome to another analysis video. If you enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. So tonight is a very special video because I'm joined by special guest Phil Palmer himself. So we're going to be watching his solo together and uh, Phil will be taking us through what he did, what it was like on the day and just give us the insight of the person who played the solo at the time. Good day, Phil. What's happening? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm all, I'm struggling with a, a bit of a virus that's been going around. I can't breathe properly at the moment. Oh, oh no. So, I mean, what we're going to be attempting to do today is uh, watch a video and I'm going to kind of present that through uh, Google Meets and hopefully you'll be able to see it and hear it. And we'll be able to kind of jump into the video. The first thing that grabs you or hits you when you're watching it is that everyone on stage is really into it that everyone's having a great time and i think that does so much to, to just like obviously the audience when they're there but when you're watching it as a video you instantly get into it because <laughs> especially I mean, ray cooper i mean <laughs> I, I don't think i've ever seen a performance um where he's not just giving it 100 percent I mean, that band, I think, was the best band in the world. Everyone was so good. Mm -hmm. and it, was a, it was a real privilege for me to be involved in that band. And, uh, consequently, playing things spontaneously. And a lot of stuff ha happens you know, like that, spur of the moment. Mm -hmm. And everyone was good enough to say, OK, we'll go with that and uh, you know, follow that and see where it goes. And, and if it worked, it would general, generally stay in the set. Uh, for a while until someone else did something else better. It's just, it was constantly evolving and constantly fascinating to be involved in. And that solo, I think you're talking about before you accuse me. Yes, yeah. Uh, it was spontaneous and unplanned and uh, interesting for lots of, lots of reasons. Yeah, it's one of those uh, situations where Eric uh, breaks a string and you have to kind of uh, roll with the punches live. Um, another thing that I noticed is that uh, right at the beginning of the song, um, yeah, everything starts fine, but Eric's a little bit, he's kind of relaxed, he's so relaxed into it, he kind of misses that that vocal <laughs> right at the beginning, has to quickly throw it in. Um, but right, what we'll do is, I'll try and get this up on the screen. You know, if you want to get me to stop the video, point anything out, and then just kind of, uh, just talk probably, but you can wave your arms or do whatever you want to do. But we'll, we'll jump into the performance and, see how you get on from uh, back in 1990. Let's have a listen.
<laughs> I'm just going to jump in there. I've yeah. cut Eric off uh, <laughs> mid solo uh, because we kind of want to get to the point where um, we can say that you know he's about to break a string because uh, people might not spot it. But yeah. I mean, there's kind of so much to talk about <laughs> just from as soon as the band starts up. I mean, talk about rock solid, like rhythm section just. Steve Ferroni, uh, yeah. best rock drummer in the world, in my opinion. And I guess see you kind of playing. And kind of getting into that rock solid rhythm. I was playing most of it up there. You know, the, the thing about playing anything with Eric is just avoid stepping on him. You know? Yeah, yeah. Because Eric, so Eric spent spending all the time down here and kind of taking it up that octave, kind of yeah. splitting those guitars. That was that was the brief with Eric. I mean, um, whilst he was singing, I would be playing what he would be playing, you know, normally. A song called Pretending in the set where he couldn't play the licks and sing at the same time. So I did. Mm. Uh, and uh, But it was very flexible and it, it you know, changes changed a lot over the period that I worked with him, but carry on. So we'll just jump in there because, I mean, when Eric breaks his string, this is the thing that I, I think, yeah, Joe Public is never going to know anything happened apart from when he's kind of just getting the string out of the way. And I love his reaction because as soon as the, the string goes, it's kind of just a, oh. <laughs> it's, it's literally, yeah, it, it, it doesn't affect him at all, not, not a problem. And it's, you know, and then he's just getting through the rest of that solo. In fact, I'm going to just, can take it back to see um, what he was playing in order to actually make the string break <laughs> to, to see what he was going for. Okay, let's take it back a little bit more. Just before that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what he was going for. Um, Um, I think he was doing one of those, so kind of <laughs> trying to get it all the way up there, which would be what a, a two-tone bend. <laughs> if you, yeah, if, if you, he would do go launching into stuff like that. Yeah, 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 something up there. Yeah, two tones. Yeah. Again, it's it's the recovery because well, I mean, we'll watch it from here again so that people can take him the fact that Eric when he gets back into his solo he's now focusing on the other strings but not as so you'd notice And, <laughs> I mean, front and centre now, Phil Palmer, <laughs> about to, yeah, lay down a solo. What um, I'm interested in knowing is, were you aware that Eric had broken his string? And were you then thinking, or if you did 
know that. Were you thinking ahead to kind of filling in the solo? Uh, I was aware they'd broken the string, um, and I, but I didn't for one minute think it would say take it, Phil. But um, when it happened, it was it was quite a, a strange moment because not for, not because I was particularly nervous. I wasn't. Really. I mean, there was 120,000 people there, as you can see. Yes. <laughs> which is fine. You know, one gets used to that. Uh, and I think it was live on TV. So there was another few million people watching it on TV. I didn't think about all that. But what really bothered me was that off to my right, just as um, Eric wandered around the back to change guitar, there was standing Mark Knopfler, <laughs> who was due to come on later um during the set standing there in his brown suit with his pencil sir uh, mm. at the side of the stage and and I, I had a glance over and there's mark and eric chatting while <laughs> while i was doing my solo and um it was a little bit of a nervous moment a bit intimidating having both of them watching me doing a solo in front of those people but i kind of got away with it i'd, I'd say more than that <laughs> but it's interesting to hear from your point of view, because I think a lot of people watching would just assume that, you know, you're kind of playing and not really taking anything else in. But it shows the level of, I guess, subconsciousness <laughs> or the subconscious level that you need to be at with your instrument to take in everything, but still be able to effectively play and focus and do what you do on the fretboard i think it's instinct kicked in at that point you know i mean it's a 12 bar in e it's not it's not rocket science um and under normal circumstances if you're sitting in your front room you'd play you'd play a solo and that's the only way that you can kind of look at it and that was one of the lessons that was invaluable to me um standing behind eric for a few years watching that happen and him you know at the Albert Hall, for example, it's it's as if Eric is sitting in his lounge at home, but there's seven thousand people watching him, you know. But it, it's that level of relaxation that makes it work for him. And um, I'd learned that lesson, I think, by then. And I just just played, and I I chose a note to start on, and just decided, you know, okay, let's go from here and see what happens. Yeah. Right, let's see what happens. <laughs> we'll jump back into it. And <laughs> there we have it. I mean, for me, I mean, what I love about the solo is the way that, yeah, obviously it's, well, actually not obviously that it's off the cuff. It, it could be quite easily something that somebody had worked out because of the way that it kind of flows. And I mean, it is an extended solo. It's not as if, you know, you just kind of one time round, oh, and then you're, you're, you're away, you know. <laughs> We've got a couple of times round, so there's, the, you know, there's a the lot, lot of space to fill in there, literally just going with it all the time. Yeah, I mean, spontaneous is, it was the only way that I could do that. I mean, uh, you'll notice there's a, there's a kind of two-second delay before I start playing anything because I was consciously going through the, you know, I thought, okay, I'll, I'll wind in the mid boost and uh, yeah, you know, give it a bit more, bit more welly. Yeah, that's it. W with the tone as well. I mean, it's, it's that perfect balance of kind of buttery, smooth, yeah, middly, but it's got a, just enough on there. Like you, you can hear that kind of, it's, it's a hint of a harmonic, like I think on one of the bends that you did. 
I was using Mesa Boogie back then, and um, the, the meshes were great for that. You know, you, they, you could take liberties with the meshes, and they would kind of forgive you. Um, so I, you know, I, I knew what was going to happen with the guitar. I mean, I, this was this guitar thing, was, uh, and I'd, I've used this guitar on many occasions. There's, an, there's another clip that you might try and find one day of uh, Brian Adams. Um, we did a song called Everything I Do, I Do For You at the party at the Palace for the Queen in Buckingham Palace. And it was the same guitar, same, I think it was the same man. But uh, that gig, they had a big PA set up in the garden of Buckingham Palace. And there was a, there were PA stations all the way up Pall Mall. Right, so, um, and there was a, you know, estimated half a million people up there. Again, apart from, you know, a few million people watching on television. And uh, because the PA was so high in volume, my guitar became kind of alive yeah. under my fingers. All I had to do was, and, and it would start to feed back. And so it was a case of trying to be able to control the thing rather than, you know, rather than play anything. But I, I managed to do it and uh, through a series of sort of subtle movements to try to control the feedback, which was, it was quite difficult. But that's all the experience of, of doing it for, for many years, you know. If, it, if I'd have panicked at that moment, it could have been nasty, but uh, it wasn't. This guitar, you know, is, is very forgiving. The, the amps I was using are, were brilliant. You, they do what you expect them to do. They, they respond in the way that you hope they will. And, uh, you know, I always use uh, my little compressor on everything, my little Boss compressor, which is down here now, and a volume pedal. So if things do get out of control for whatever reason, I can always back off with my foot. But it's another level of stagecraft, I guess, or being so well versed at playing live that yeah you start to understand like you said angles and just where you need to be to um, and i sometimes get this comment on on my channel actually quite a lot in the comment section saying um you know how did he make that note last for so long which pedal is he using <laughs> and all that kind of stuff i say oh no he's he's angling his guitar and going to that specific you know i mean gary moore did this on on, on stage a lot as well, going to that specific point where he knows that this is the feedback point and angle. Yeah. Um, I saw Jimi Hendrix when I was 14 at the Albert Hall. And uh, he was, you know, the big Marshall Stacks and stuff like that. He was playing with feedback then, so that was in the 60s. Um, and I, I looked at that and I thought that's insane what he's doing um it's i you know i considered that hendrix was from another planet because the way he played guitar was so alien to everything that everybody else was doing i mean in the audience they would be eric and they would be jeff beck you know mm. like this watching what he was doing because he kind of invented that whole technique but it, his whole you know his whole thing with moving the guitar around was so that he could find the you know the, the harmonic feedback the right one and play with it yeah. That was really interesting for me. I'm just going to jump in here to say that this concludes part one of my chat with Phil because we did talk for quite a while, so I'm going to edit it to be as concise as possible, but even doing that, because we covered so much, there's going to be a part two, which will be the next video that's released on the channel. So thank you guys for watching part one. If you did enjoy it, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. As always, let me know what you guys think, and I'll see you guys at part two. Rock!